Well, I'm not going to talk about my musical screen-based instruments, which many of you know already anyway. So these are kind of um, live coding um, languages that I've been making and, and uh, basically creating systems. That I see this as an instrument, almost like a piece. So it's, it, in a way, it's, it's, it's like the, the Haldora form, you know, it's a, it's a constraint system and I'm able to play it through the notation of, of code. Um, but that's um, something, that's just, so, you, so I present the work a little bit. <laughs> what I really want to talk about is this um, concept of musical organics. It, it started like a joke. It is a joke, maybe. Maybe you can tell me it's not a joke, but um, I, was, I was thinking about organology, which is the science of instruments. An organ is a Greek word which means an instrument, so our heart is an instrument, it beats. Um, an organ is an instrument and, 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 and a guitar is an instrument, so we, these are just organs. Stelios, is it still called organ uh, uh, in yes, Greek? But it, is, uh, it can be an instrument but it is also, uh, yeah, as you said, like the heart with only an organ. Yeah, so in modern uh, Greek, a guitar is an organ. Yes. Yes. Brilliant. And the policeman is an organ also. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, organology then? No. Uh, so, yeah, so it's a system of classification, categorization, and cataloging uh, objects that are fluid. That's maybe what policemen do. They put things into cages and you know, put, classify things. And um, then we have these situations where this is uh, an Aeolian wind park. Uh, where it doesn't fit into any classifications because live is normally fluid. Uh, things are not categorized uh, when they appear in nature. We have things that cross boundaries always. So give, give me a, a definition of something. This is very Wittgensteinian kind of idea. Give me a definition of something uh, and I'll find a way to uh, counterexample to, to your definition. But it has a long history, this thing, organology, and the most famous system is by Sachs and Hornpostel um, in 1914. They created, they defined these four types of instruments, idiophones, membranophones, chordophones, and aerophones. And um, in 1940, Sachs uh, added electrophones, and he was thinking about theremin and uh, other such instruments. Um, so you can think about the instruments that we've seen today, where do they fit really? Um, the the Haldorophone would be a, a, a mixture between the electrophone and the chordophone already, so we, we have a problem <laughs> with, the, with the, this type of approach where in, in the organological system you're, you're able to go down into the nuances of uh, definitions and you can come up with a system of categorization where you actually have, yeah, this is a set of clapper bells and it belongs to the hierarchical tree um, like this. So it's a human nature to try to classify things and obviously this is good if you're running a museum of instruments. It's good to know where to put them. <laughs> um, this is this is third floor. <laughs> That's queen. Like this. Lots of bells there. Um, but, uh, but, but, but live is not like that. Languages are not like that. Musical genres are not like that. Um, they don't fit into this. This is um, from Aristoteles's kind of categorizations, and, and this has been kind of uh, in our Western culture very strong, this desire to classify things into, into the order, nature. Um, but it can be very useful. Uh, I'm not saying organology is a bad science or anything, it's, it's fantastic. You can see there's some useful things here that we can learn from and think about. And you can see, for example, in the uh, field of nine, how, how people have been applying these things these ways in, in different, 
different manners. So for example, I can see the next slide here. For example, here we have a, a, a phone and there's this guy blowing into the phone, into the microphone, and that noise coming from the microphone is then translated into the pitch that he's playing. So we're getting here, you know, some kind of, where is it blowing? Yeah, here. We're getting inspiration, maybe. I don't know if it's direct or indirect, but there is, there is this way of, of finding that continuity. And uh, we see that the digital is applying technologies that we know and we learn and we understand from the, from the acoustic instruments. But you see something different here. You see this is actually a musical score that is moving like that. And the player is following the, the score and playing. So that's quite interesting, a musical instrument with the score on itself, and you just have to play it. That's a bit like the animated <coughs> scores that uh, you were talking about. Or um, Sam Duffy, she's been working on the clapping music. Um, you know, the piece by, by Steve Wright. And um, in that application, that app, you're actually performing the piece. But it's also a game. You get scores. So you, you, the, the, the distinction between playing a game and playing music kind of disappears a little bit. So there's something that the digital adds to, to these things, to the organology, and that's why I put this picture up. This is Michel Weisswitz who used to run this place, and this is Leo Theremin. And I think, think that what they're doing is very similar, but there's something essentially different here, because what Theremin has is a um, is a natural mapping between you know, the, the magnetic field here and the sound. Whereas um, <coughs> Michel Weisswitz can use algorithms to remap or distribute mapping. And, and there's no natural mapping happening here, where it is here. So there's something, something weird that happens with the digital, something, something new, something completely new. So I then started to think, does it make sense to have a category called the digiphone? I mean, would Sax today, would he, in 1996 or something, would he have come up with the concept of the digiphone? Mm. I don't think so. I think he would just be confused and give up. <laughs> um, so, and the reason I, I, I think this is because um, I'm, I'm, I kind of like this quote by Nietzsche where he says that the sciences, they um, throw um, pale, cool, grey conceptual nets over the colourful confusion of sense, the rubble of the senses. Um, so sciences, they, you know, the, the world is chaos and we kind of throw our conceptual nets over it. And it's, it's kind of a, yeah, I think it's a very beautiful quote. There's a more sociology uh, approach, sociology of science, Volker and Starr, they've been thinking about this type of classification as well. Um, where systems of classification start to become actors, or they start to control the way that we, we think about things. And you see that with certain languages where the language is not allowed to evolve because of the way that some people are controlling the, the grammar of, of the language. So we're talking about black boxing then, black boxing of, of, of the world, we're putting things into categories, and um, Volker and Starr again, they say the more naturalized the object becomes, the more unquestioning the relationship of the community to it, so we start to unquestion the thing when the violin has a history. We stop, stop questioning it. We, we can still question the Haldorophon now, but in 50 years' time we will have put it into a black box and we stop questioning it. It's part of history if you, if you do your job well, you know. 
Um, so, and, and, and the questioning, the, the, the thoughts that we had, they become part of a forgotten memory. That relates to what Andrew was talking about earlier. Um, that there are things that, that we forget. Uh, no, that we don't document, but we learn from. They're there. You mentioned that as well in, in a comment to that, that there are certain things. So, I just want to end then with this thing of, you, you know, uh, those of you who have read Deleuze and Gattari, the Rhizome, um, I think it's, uh, yeah, well, I'm not going to talk about what I think about. I think, I think the idea of the Rhizome is really interesting, and we had the tree as well, so we had the hierarchy and the heterarchy. So these are two ways of, of, of looking at the world. This is the way that Nietzsche talks about. And there's another way of looking at the world, which is about seeing connections. Um, a bit like the neurons in our brain. Our brain is not like that. Our brain is like that. Uh, connections are made. So that's how I ended up with this musical organics thing. Organics is about nature, flowers, plants. Um, but it's also a German word for organology, actually. So I thought, um, I, I found some text translated into English in, in 1890 or something, and, and it was translated into English as, as musical organics. So I thought that was, that was kind of an interesting coincidence. But here, um, we then tried to frame the ecosystem of musical techniques as a reticulated web, one that hybridizes older organologies, continually borrowing, referencing, appropriating, and representing the techniques incorporated in human movement. Um, so this is a, heterarchi a heterarchical organology, which doesn't make sense because it's not organics. Um, and uh, and that's, the, that's, that's how the, the, this, uh, the idea of the symposium came out. So, so what many of us have been talking about this morning is this thing of borrowing, referencing, appropriating, and representing techniques from the analog world taken into the digital. Um, and I think if an instrument dies, that's not such a bad thing because there are certain things that you as an instrument maker or someone who performed it, or even just people in the audience who observed the instrument. They learned the techniques. Like we've learned the technique of moving the mouse like this to control the cursor of a, of a two-dimensional space that is upright. We don't move the mouse like that, we move it like that. This is a technique that we had to learn about 20 years ago or something. If not, yeah. 30 years ago. Um, and it's not a natural mapping, it's just a technique. And these type of techniques, they, they become incorporated into the culture and I think they continue to exist. So, so it's almost like no project is a failed project. If the ingenuity in the design of the instrument, whether it's um, sound or human uh, human technology interaction um, or communication between uh, performers through media, all these different things. You, you, you come up with a language and that's what we're doing. We're always creating a language, lang language of design, language of composition, um, language of performance and movement because sound is movement. Um, so, so that's maybe what I think is interesting here is that the digiphone is something that picks up things from everywhere. It pulls in technologies, techniques, patterns from acoustic instruments. And um, you cannot put it in a category because anything could be pulled in. It is a rhizome. It's a rhizomatic thing. It's not a tree. Um, it's a network of things. 
So, so yeah, so that's maybe why I propose this word organics for that, if you agree. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if it's fully developed, this argument, so we can, <laughs> we can um, argue about it um, later. But um, that's it, and time for uh, questions or coffee.